Over the eons, their descendants evolved into lots of different animals, including primates, including us. That's how we got our start. But what if you turn back the clock? What if that asteroid had taken a slightly different course and missed Earth completely? Little mammals may have never gotten their chance because the dinosaurs could still be in charge today. And instead of me, one of them might be hosting this show. Thank you. Thank you very much. In some ways, we owe our existence to serendipity. And some argue that this makes the evolution of intelligence far less likely. Our brains evolved through many stages. The little rodents, the early primates, and later on, we branched from the apes. This worked for us, but is it the only route to intelligence? Would an alien species have to go through the same steps? There is no way to know for sure, but on our planet, lots of animals have remarkable brains and behavior, including some that are very distant from us on the evolutionary tree. Among them are the cephalopods, including octopus, squid, and cuttlefish. Cephalopods are mollusks. They're related to clams and oysters, but they don't look much like them at all. And in the evolutionary terms, they've evolved in a very different way. Roger Hanlon has spent the last 30 years studying the behavior of these animals. Behavior that is their main defense from ending up as dinner. These animals are a yummy hunk of protein swimming around in the ocean. And once they're caught, they have no defenses. So they have to have a good primary defense. That's camouflage. Don't be seen. In the lab, Hanlon and his team study how cephalopods, like this cuttlefish, control and change their skin patterns. It's taking that visual information and translating it to the skin on the back. This is beautiful. Look at that perfect white square. To see how they apply their tricks in their natural habitat, Hanlon tails them with his underwater camera. His biggest challenge, finding them in the first place. Octopus and cuttlefish have an uncanny ability to completely disappear into the background. We all think of the chameleon as sort of the king or queen of color change, but that's not true. A cephalopod can show many more patterns and can show them instantaneously. An octopus can be so camouflaged, you literally cannot see it. So every place they go, they are morphing into something that looks a lot like that environment. So here's the scene. You've got a rock with algae all over it. There appears to be nothing there except the swimming fish going by. OK, so take a look here and just watch for a moment. There it is. Whoa. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? This animal was completely camouflaged on that rock, and suddenly it was there. This remarkable camouflage, changing both pattern and three-dimensional texture, is performed by skin unlike any other animals. It's an amazing skin because there are up to 20 million of these chromatophore pigment cells. And to control 20 million of anything is going to take a lot of processing power. We call it a computer. Animals have brains. These animals have extraordinarily large, complicated brains to make all this work. Looks like. For Hanlon, the brains and sophisticated behavior of these animals suggest that there's more than just one way to get smart. Very inquisitive animal. That's quite extraordinary. Even an invertebrate animal related to a clam or a snail can develop an incredibly complicated brain. This is one of the true wonders of nature. It's hard to explain why, but it's everywhere. 
What does this mean about the universe and other intelligent life? The building blocks are potentially there and complexity will arise. Evolution is the force that's pushing that. I would expect personally a lot of diversity and a lot of complicated structures. It may not look like us, but my personal view is that there is intelligent life out there. But intelligent life is not necessarily life we can talk to across the depths of space. For that, you need technology. As smart as an octopus or a dolphin is, neither one of them is going to build a radio transmitter or a spaceship. When paleontologist Peter Ward looks at Earth's track record, the odds for technological aliens don't seem very promising. There's maybe 30 million species on the planet today. And if we look at the fossils, there are hundreds of millions of species in the past, but only one of them which has risen to technology. It's happened one time out of hundreds of millions of possibilities on planet Earth. One time, one time only. So that's an astronomically small number. Here on Earth, we are the only species that has mastered technology. Since it's so rare here, should we really expect technology to be common among the aliens? Many would say no. But the folks at SETI continue to hope. And Tom, look at this one because... Searching for alien signals night after night can test anyone's patience. Unless, of course, you find one. Most evenings, SETI will get a false alarm or two. But one night in 1997, they received a signal so strong and true it looked as if their long search might be over. We were observing at another telescope in West Virginia, and we got this signal that started to pass all the automated tests that we use to determine, is it really extraterrestrial, is it just more interference? The lead astronomer that evening was SETI director Jill Tarter. Following standard procedure, she pointed the receiving dish away from the star where the signal appeared to originate. If the signal remained, it was just a stray transmission from Earth. But when they moved the dish, the signal went away. And when it was pointed back at the star, the signal returned. Excited, the SETI team repeated the test. We went off in another direction and the signal went away and we came back and it was there. And we went off in another direction and the signal went away and we came back and it was there. And it was now getting very interesting. Interesting, because the signal might actually be coming from deep space. The excitement quickly spread back to SETI headquarters in Mountain View, California. I was back in Mountain View. We were watching the signal on remote monitors, OK? Well, after about four or six hours of this, still passing the tests, needless to say, our blood pressure definitely was rising. And I was so excited that exactly what I was looking for was right there staring me in the face. By now, the star had set. The next night would tell the tale. If the signal returned, perhaps E.T. was finally on the line. I, for one, couldn't sit down. I was just sort of pacing around. A lot of people were huddled around the, the, the computers. Nobody went home. Nobody went out 